Did you get your invite yet? You know, the invite to that charity tournament you agreed to last week? Or the new league your crazy co-worker asked you to join? Now that you have the invite, you realize that it's an IDP league and you are not prepared. You know some of the big names, but it's all the others that you're a little bit hazy on. Is that you? Well, if I'm being honest, it is a little bit me. But we are here to help you tonight on The Rod Pod. It's time to pull up a chair and talk some IDP football. I am your host, J.J. Wenner, and this is the Rider Dynasty Podcast. With me is my co-host, Joe Harlow. In the great Northwest. And tonight, we are going to help you find the undervalued defensive players to win you championships. Championships, right? That's what we're here to do. And to help us out, we would like to welcome... Well, let's just say it. The heart and soul of IDP Plus. He's the content manager, an editor, uh, a podcaster. He writes, he ranks. Not only that, he also is an ECR ranker for Fantasy Pros. An all-around great guy. You can find him on X at Dynasty Santa. It's Steve Thomason. How you doing, buddy? Holy moly, I think that's the best entrance uh, intro I've ever gotten. That was amazing. <laughs> well, then I'll have you back on the show. What's new with you, my friend? Uh, just, you know, it's August and the clock is officially turned. So the brains are in gear for draft modes, uh, you know, late dynasty drafts, uh, redraft leagues coming off. So it's, it's all gas right now. <laughs> <laughs> are you coming to Canton? Let me rephrase. I am. Let me rephrase. Oh. You are coming to Canton, correct? Yes. Very good. Hopefully, I'm not going to run up on the car full of IDP plusers this year and <laughs> yell at Matt Recker to sing me a song at like three in the morning. Not <laughs> one of my best moments, but let's be honest, awesome. <laughs> not my worst moment. Yeah. Definitely not my worst moment. Oh, <laughs> uh, so. Before we get started, let's get a word from our main sponsor. Now, Steve, Joe, and I were able to get the first look at the new IDP Plus website the other night, and it is awesome. And if I'm being honest, I didn't really like the old website. And this one is better organized. It runs smoother. It's so pretty. And we are getting ready to launch our new prop betting tool, which is going to help you pick all of your IDP prop bets. So head over to IDP Plus, a new website, IDP Plus, P-L-U-S, dot com after the show. Check out the website and take advantage of the special membership offers. The link and details are in the show description. All right, gentlemen, we are starting with the big men up front, the defensive tackles. Now, Steve, for the most part, if your league doesn't require DTs, do you draft them? Oh, interesting question. Um, it, I think it depends on the total number of defensive line then required start. So if it's just one, uh, typically no, as long as sacks are rewarded appropriately. I usually like a cutoff of about at least uh, six points for sacks and then, you know, stacking potentially tackles for loss on top of that and whatnot. Um, but yeah, if there's only one defensive lineman generally, no, if there's even two or more, you can make certainly an argument for a handful of the elite tier uh, defensive tackles for sure. Okay. That makes sense to me. Now, since we generally start only one to two defensive tackles, if we're in a DT required league tonight, I'm just going to have these gentlemen highlight one each. So, Steve, you're up first. Who is your undervalued DT? So, man, this guy, when I when I caught a peek at his um, uh, his overall consensus on the Fantasy Pros ECR, I was a bit shocked. So, I've got Dexter Lawrence of the New York Giants uh, coming in currently as, well, so they do it by defensive line overall, but the DL58. Um 
I mean, Lawrence, first of all, is just a massive beast of a human being. Um, as well as, you know, if you put any stock into uh, PFF metrics and whatnot, I mean, he's hip, hip of the top on almost everything. Uh, his pass rush, win rate, all the pass rushing metrics, uh, as well as tackles and everything. So last year, I think people are down on him just because the counting stats weren't there. He wasn't converting a ton of sacks, and the tackles seem to be eluding him. But he's in that backfield causing chaos, causing pressure. So this year, if, if you've been following along with the Giants, especially on the, the Hard Knocks uh, front office, they have added Mr. Brian Burns to that defensive line to go along with Kayvon Thibodeau, Aziz Ojolari, and I think they got – a decent other name that's escaping me right now um, in the in the middle there. So I think he's with this surrounding of the immense talent upgrades that they've gotten. Um, I just think Lawrence is going to be in line to smash his return on investment um, at DL 58. <laughs> yeah, he was not even ranked in the top 156 overall for fantasy pros. So yeah. definitely undervalued. Uh, Mr. Harlow, yes. who is your player? So first, got to say, Dexter Lawrence, one of my famous misses in the draft. was not a fan of him, but it's not fair how good he is. I think we saw a lot of Kayvon Thibodeau's empty calories came as a result of Dexter just being awesome. Yeah. Brian Burns in tow, whew, it's going to be fun. I am staying in the division as Dexter Lawrence, going with a young guy, someone who I think Santa is going to enjoy a lot on this list. That is second-year pro Jalen Carter for the Eagles, formerly of my Georgia Bulldogs. Dude's just a monster. Like, he was such a highly touted prospect. He was my number two overall prospect in that class. With If there wasn't the car racing issue, he probably would have been number one over Will Anderson. It was a coin flip either way. But looking at last year when Fletcher Cox, a future Hall of Famer who is now gone, was there, his total numbers didn't end up being great. But if you look at his metrics, especially those PFF ones, like his win percentage, sixth amongst defensive tackles. And the sample size is those with 20% of the max pass rush snaps. So we're keeping guys with like two rushes out of there because that's not really yeah. <laughs> Um His wow. pass rush. His, he had total pressures, was 15th amongst D tackles, 12th in hurries. His PRP, which is just kind of a pass rush success metric, he was 13th amongst D tackles. And that's, again, on limited snaps as a rookie. And you saw his talent. There were some games where he was, especially as the Eagles defense kind of fell apart towards the end of the year, he was dominating still. He was really a one-man wrecking crew for a while. I just The sky is the limit for this guy in a D-line 57 and D tackle, I think he's outside the top 12 D tackles too. He's just one of those guys who you can snag late and can just bl absolutely blow up and be a league changing sort of pick. All right. Well, we are starting hot here. We had Dexter Lawrence and Jalen Carter as our two undervalued defensive tackles. And now we're going to move on to the glory boys, the edges. Now, if you're old like me, sometimes we called them outside linebackers, defensive ends, but in this world of true position, I'm just going to call them edges. So since we draft more edges than DT, Steve, I'm going to need two from each of you. So, Steve, who is your first undervalued edge? So my first guy I've got is Rashawn Gary out of uh, Green Bay there. Uh, just signed a massive extension, so they – they totally believe in the talent. Been a bit snake bitten with injuries. So if you look at, you know, he's never really had a uh, massive season, you know, on a per year basis, um, just due to, you know, random bad luck and things like that. But if you kind of take a bird's eye view of, of the games he's played in and not missed, um, his per game metrics are incredible and his per game fantasy points are pretty incredible too. And I think if – he gets on the field or stays on the field this year, uh, the snap counts are really going to rise. Um, Preston Smith there is hit pretty long in the tooth. So I think I think they're ready to just absolutely unleash this guy on the league. Um, and I really hope that they that they give him the, the snaps that he's deserving of. So uh, sitting there is DL 26. Uh, I think that's a mess. So right outside the top 24, I, you know, I think if he plays a full year, he easily lands in the top 12 as a, as a DL1 guy this year. So, 
And right now he is ranked 122nd. Hmm. That's crazy. As overall IDP. All right, Joe, who is your first player? I am going to go to, well, Steve just hit one, or Santa just hit one of our good friend Justin Fry's favorite players. And I'm going to hit another one of our favorite players here in the Ravens, Odafe Owe, someone who I've been a massive fan of since his, well, junior year, I guess, at Penn State. Which Penn State, we'll get into them again in just a little bit. Um, oh so Owe, with having limited snap counts, he was injured at the beginning of the year. Then Jadavion Clowney and Kyle Van Noy decided to re- act like it was 2014 and absolutely went bonkers. So he didn't have a high snap share, but when he was on the field, he was incredible. Using some of those similar metrics with same boundaries, 14th highest amongst all edge rushers and win pass rush win rate 17.7 percent which was high one per whole percentage point higher than tj watt ever heard of him kind of doesn't suck the his prp was 20th the same as rashawn gary and uh will anderson so again pretty good enough metric he's actually he's very reminiscent of a jermaine johnson someone who i've been super high on who we've loved as idp plus staff who is at 20 D-line 20, I believe. There's a lot of similarities between him and Owe. Owe, who's at D-line 72, by the way. They're three weeks apart. Owe is three weeks older, like 23 days. Um, they have He has been in the league one year longer than Johnson, but doesn't super count because of the Penn State tax, which freak <laughs> athlete who did zero development. Total pressures, they were actually... Owe had one less total pressure than Jermaine Johnson, who was 30th amongst edge rushers. Hurries was 25th amongst edge rushers, the same as Jermaine Johnson. Looking at athletics, athleticism, their RAS score, Owe was a 9.7, Johnson a 9.2. Very similar profiles. Owe just has a little more top-end speed and a little bit better on the jumps. He's a great power rusher, again, like Johnson. I think in this Ravens defense, which is going to regress a bit without Mike McDonald, but there's no one else there who is going to challenge our way for snaps. If he can stay healthy, this is the time for him to break out. And if he can do put up these similar metrics as he has in a limited sample, sky's the limit. Man, Joe, I love when you compare players to Jets players. Uh, always warms my heart. It makes me like. Oh, wait, Honestly, a little Jermaine bit Johnson, more. I got to say, even at 20, I was really debating at putting here, but had to rein myself in a little bit. Yeah, that still is undervalued, though. Mm. Seems like the cat's out of the bag on him, unfortunately. Shh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, we yeah. won't talk about it too loudly. Um, well, Santa, who's your next guy? All right, my next guy is uh, right behind uh, Rashawn, or right in front of Rashawn Gary, actually, um, as the, the DL25. Uh, let me just make sure that's still active. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, no, DL55. DL55. Um, we had him mixed up, I think, with uh, with who, the, who he is replacing in Hassan Reddick. Hassan Reddick is still on the board um, as ECR as uh, DL25. But I, like Bryce Huff, the new Eagles replacement uh, for Hassan Reddick, uh, going at dl 55 um in the rankings there i think that is an incredible value i think you know if you now of course we can't just unfortunately take us on reddick's you know stats and plug them in for bryce hoff i think we can go pretty darn close to it though um although we are going to see you know for former first round pick nolan smith is going to get a lot of run this year a lot more opportunity after playing basically redshirting his entire uh, rookie season, barely stepped onto the field last year. Um, But Bryce Huff, another PFF darling, uh, topping all the metrics of edge rushers, um, or nearing the top, I should say, um, in in win rate and all that good stuff. So uh, I think, you know, now Vic Fangio comes to town for the Eagles, so we might see slightly different um, deployment than we did with Hassan Reddick in the past. However, I'm actually supremely more confident in a Vic Fangio system. Uh, he, you know, if you remember yeah. two years ago, people were super frustrated with Jalen Phillips, right, and his usage, and why is he dropping into coverage and he's not getting sacked, he's not getting tackles um, for for all that. And then Vic Fangio comes along last year in Miami, and boom, Jalen Phillips just 
it, he was all a bunch of our like number one breakout guy lived up to the hype until the unfortunate injury. I think Fangio, I mean, also Bradley Chubb was eating in that same system. So there's room for two guys to eat in a huff and either Nolan Smith or maybe Josh Sweat comes back to uh, actually doing something this year. Um, but I think Bryce Huff, they signed him to a nice little contract there. I think he's going to be the de facto uh, one edge rusher there in that system. Uh, so kind of the Jalen Phillips of the Eagles defense. And I'm really excited for that role. So he is another guy who I think could smash the value there. Um, I kind of like to look at guys going around. I mean, for, for crying out loud, Demarcus Lawrence is ahead of him. I mean, ask anybody who you would you rather have this year, Bryce Huff or Demarcus Lawrence. I think you'll get 100% in Bryce Huff responses there. So, uh, you know, just one example of someone going ahead of him that couldn't disagree more with. <laughs> so Marcus Lawrence needs to tackle the versatility. Why do yeah. we think Bryce Huff is ranked so low? Probably just because the unknown factor and, you know, with the Jets, you know, the guys, the crazies like us that are deep into the PFF metrics and stuff know him, but he didn't really put together uh, a standout season. He wasn't, what did he end up with in sets this year? Give me one. I just don't think he put together the counting stats quite yet to be on people's radar. According to PFF. Oh, he's still going to get 10, but not a lot of tackles, right? Um, yeah, 29 combined tackles. So even with 10 sacks. Kind of like, I don't want to spoil a pick coming up here, but another guy who had 10 sacks with actually even more tackles who I think people are kind of sleeping on. But yeah, the 29 uh, combined, only 19 solos, you know, you're betting on picking the right week for him uh, on the sack. I think that the, the tackle numbers go at least double, at, the ver- at a minimum double that. Um, so that's why I think he's kind of off people's radar because he just doesn't show up on a lot of the uh, – you know, average points leaders from last year. Uh, even if you score sack strongly, he, you know, with the low tackle numbers, he just isn't going to show up in probably even the top 50, which, you know, goes in line with the rankings here. So, yeah, kind of makes sense. But this is what we do. We project for the roles. We project for the playing time. The playing time was uh, – snap counts was uh, 42% yeah. last year. You know that that's probably going to double. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, those are the primary reasons I think that he people might be sleeping on the name. Fantastic. So question for both of you, as JJ, as a Jets fan, where Huff came from, and Santa a fan of where he is now. Are you concerned about uh, he hasn't played the run at all? He's been a pass rush specialist. Any concern if he can actually hold up with the run and actually increase tackle totals, or if that'll playing against the run will drop his pass rush efficiency. I think it would definitely drop his, drop his efficiency. I mean, I think we saw last year what he was in the top five with like Micah Bosa, who um, Mm -hmm. Aiden Hutchinson and Parsons and Garrett, like he was in great company up Mm -hmm. there. I think if he has to play the run a lot more, I mean, he was a designated pass rusher for the jets. It, it has to affect Maybe mm-hmm. his win rate a little bit, but if it's increasing his tackle numbers, like Santa said, that might Not, just be you don't a think it'll drop him enough. Just wash it out. I don't think so. Yeah. I don't think so. I believe in Huff. I wish we would have resigned him as a Jets fan, um, especially now that Reddick isn't even suiting up for us. <laughs> uh, ah, shut up, Santa. Uh, <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. It's okay. It's okay. So, uh, but yeah, no, I, I think Huff will, especially with those two big guys on the big uglies on the inside. Yeah. I mean, that, man, that's Davis and Carter eating up all they that. Don't forget Milton Williams. Oh, oh, big Mil- yeah. They like have a thousand sure. pounds of beef in the middle of that line. My, my answer is, yeah, I, I don't, I probably, I guess I don't care because just on the increased snap, assuming the increased snap counts alone, and increased tackle production. I mean, I kind of almost do expect the 10 sacks to come along with them, but you know, if he drops to eight, you know, makes it up plus some with tackles um, in the playing time. And also, you know, learning from Banjo, hopefully they get him to understand how important he's going to need to be to play against the run there in that system. Um, 
So yeah, I'm just going to bet on the coaching there, hopefully, and bet on the, the the opportunity. I mean, if they brought him in and swapped him out to to play similar snap counts and be a similar role to the Jets, that would be sh- both shocking and incredibly disappointing to me. Uh, but if he is on the field and a run liability, yeah, we got to figure that out. But uh, you know, our our traditional linebacker core, um, you know, bringing in Devin White this year, hopefully gets a little bit better and can support any potential deficiencies there um, for Bryce Huff. And, you know, hopefully he just figures it out. <laughs> All right, Joe. Who's yeah, your guy? I tend to agree there with Huff. I think a huge thing is having a great coach who can utilize them well. Mm-hmm. And that's a big theme with my next player, the former number one overall pick, Trayvon Walker. Like that transition, JJ? I, like, I do like that transition. <laughs> Thank you. But – um, like Santa alluded to, double-digit sack player like Huff last year, 52 total tackles. The metrics aren't as great. Win percentage was close to like a Yutir Gross Matos and Dio De Ingbo, which aren't the greatest names. Pass rush um, effectiveness, that PRP is like Hassan Reddick, who was, and Harold Landry, who were both injured a lot last year. It's bit just top 50 amongst edge rushers. His counting stats were really good, but a huge factor is he's still really good against the run. I think Ryan Nielsen, the new defensive coordinator, who might not necessarily be an upgrade over Mike Caldwell, but he thrives and makes defensive ends, especially massive defensive ends who tend to do better against the run, do like he gets the most out of them. See with Cam Jordan, Carl Granderson from when he was with the Saints. Last year, there isn't like a huge name from Atlanta, but they don't really have any rushers there, but Arnold Ebichetti and Zach Harrison had pretty good ends of their seasons under Nielsen. I think that he, if anyone's going to get out of Trayvon Walker, what he can be, it's this guy. And at DL 35, willing to take a shot on the talent. And again, with Josh Hines, Joshua Hines Allen in Jacksonville, taking away a lot of the pressure, Eric Armstead in the interior, two pretty good linebackers for NFL. Great for fantasy behind him I really think Walker has no pressure on him and he can really just kind of headhunt as a pass rusher and against the run I think he can really succeed a lot there Mm -hmm. I have some concerns I like what you're saying but I have like baked in doubt about him that's totally fair I don't know how to get over it I think if he was D line 25 or getting a little higher, then it's like, okay, stay away. But at this point, like, where is he? Do you have where he's ranked overall? Um, overall, he wasn't ranked in the top 156. Okay. I'm willing to take a shot on that then. Yeah. Get late round dart throw in your drafts. Absolutely. Why not? All right. Your mouth to my draft boards. All right, people, it's draft <laughs> season as the home leagues start to emerge from their slumbers. And frustrated commissioners are trying to organize draft day. Why not take one part of that nightmare off your plate and order Trophy Smack's gorgeous draft boards? Complete with player stickers so deep. How deep, JJ? They're so deep. You couldn't possibly need them all. And for the first time, Trophy Smack has an IDP expansion pack for all of you defensive degenerates like us. So no more scribbling names on blank stickers. Go to Trophy Smack and get the only draft board that meets all of your needs. Check out the link in the show notes and get yours today. All right, enough of business. Let's get back to business. Time to move on to linebackers, gentlemen. God, I miss the old days. I I, I must be get, becoming a boomer because I keep harkening back. I remember when they would wear the giant neck rolls like <laughs> oh, Brian yeah. Cox. And as yeah. a little kid, I always thought, like the more pads you wore, the better of a player you were. I was wrong, but I was wrong about a lot of things when I was a kid. So, and since we need to start more LBs, generally, I'm going to ask for two each from you. No cheating. Steve, you're up first. All right. Um, my first guy. Did we talk about possibly doing three? <laughs> hey, if you want a third. Yeah, I think give the people linebackers, right? So the first one, uh, linebacker 56, a guy I'm just enamored with this year. I'm going all in on this guy, K.J. Britt uh, from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, uh, in line to be the new 
Devin White, uh, hopefully better <laughs> results that Devin White has given us for the past couple of years. Uh, you know, coming up, coming off that nine and a half sack season a few years ago, Devin White was riding high, dynasty LB1, and then just kind of came crashing down to mediocrity uh, for the past couple of years here. So um, KJ Britt, however, a fifth rounder, I believe, uh, a few years back, um, played – very well last year in relief duty when uh, Devin White missed a handful of games. Um, there's an incredible clip out there of KJ Britt like taking over the sort of pregame, like hyping up the the circle of players and things like that. And you know everything that I've seen from people who know a heck of a lot more than I do about this guy and even from his college days and whatnot. This guy is like a natural born leader, uh, you know, taking that role of doing the pregame hype, I think speaks volumes uh, to what kind of player he's going to be in this league and, you know, in the locker room presence, uh, Levante David, who knows how long he's going to be around for uh, much longer, even this year, you know, yeah, he's still going to be the primary, but, you know, Devin White was still seeing a crap ton of snaps uh, next to him. And I don't think much changes here for KJ Brett. I do think, you know, I think there's a little concern out there for people being unsure. Is it going to be Britt? Is it going to be Servassier Dennis? Uh, JJ Russell got some run there at times last year, but I'm just, I'm pushing all my chips in on Britt uh, based on what I've seen. Uh, run, uh, run grade potential, you know, past a certain number of minimum snaps. He was uh, 34th. Um, with a 72 gray, which is pretty darn good, I think, and just considering all the linebackers that exist in the NFL. Um, so I think that bodes well for his, you know, just opportunity to stay on the field as well. If you can, if you're a, a traditional uh, linebacker who can play well against the run, I, I don't see any reason for him to be coming off the field much. All right, KJ Britt. All right, Joe, who is your first linebacker? I'm going to go with a former undrafted rookie, went a little after KJ Britt then, and Ivan Pace Jr. for the Minnesota Vikings. This is one I was telling everyone to sell Ivan Pace even a couple of weeks ago for training camp, just bringing in Blake Cashman, Van Ginkel. Um, they had another linebacker who was coming back healthy, whose name is totally gone. Either way, I thought there was no chance Ivan Pace was going to get this was going to get a chance to start no matter how much I'd loved him as a prospect loved him last year. He was great, but now the reports out of training camp are not only is he going to have a role, he's going to be the green dot player for Minnesota. It's going to be the play caller on that defense, which is impressive. There's a lot of really good, really qualified players there like Cashman, Harrison Smith, even a Josh Metellus, they all could do it, but it's going to pace. He's not the greatest of athletes, smaller player, but dude is solid, tough as nails. Last year, he was only a spot starter, still broke 100 tackles. Mm -hmm. This defensive scheme is just chaos. It's just pure chaos. As we can see with Josh Metellus' mm -hmm. usage last year, Brian Flores' time with the Patriots and Dolphins, it's just going to give a lot of opportunities for him to cause havoc. And he's a good run defender, struggles in the pass, which honestly might be good for a linebacker it's right. for fantasy. Going to get a lot of passes in front of him that he'll just wrap them up right away. So another point for you there. As a pass rusher, he actually had the third highest pass rush win rate amongst all linebackers with a good amount of pass rush snaps. Um, Quan Alexander, who had 30 pass rushes, and Ernest Jones, who is one of the best off-ball linebackers as a rusher, Ever, frankly, is how he's been so far. And those are the only two ahead of him. So, and Pace still had, despite unlimited snaps, still had a very high amount of pass rushes mm -hmm. with 109. So, which was the eighth most. So, if he's going to keep rushing the passer from that spot in this chaotic defense and has a chance to get more interceptions, I think he had three last year, some sacks and 100 tackle floor as a starter, going at linebacker 37. Yes, yeah. please. <laughs> was the green dot last year Harrison Smith? I think so. Him or or maybe it was Hicks. Because yeah, I, think Hicks Hicks. Hicks. I, think, I think it was Harrison while Hicks was out. Right. While he was healthy, I think it was Hicks. But. Yeah. All right. Well, Santa, you want to give me your second player? Yeah. So this next guy, I kind of been sort of down on, um, you know, 
coming off at the end of last year leading up to training camps here. Um, he filled in for a guy that I think a lot of us were really high on going into last year in, in Atlanta. Uh, second round pick Troy Anderson was supposed to be uh, all the buzz. He, he actually did really well in his first two weeks uh, from a fantasy scoring uh, perspective. But Nate Landman came in after after week two for, for the injured uh, Troy Anderson, who just ended up missing the entire rest of the season. And he's just – he's that was prototypical, you know, waiver wire gem find that every year two or three of these guys, Ivan Pace is another one, like, that are just always out there. Now, you know, leading up to, to the camps here, I kind of pegged Nate Landman as like Jack Sanborn 2.0, right? Like, great, you know, guys got injured. You had a really nice filling year. And now, you know, back to the back of the depth chart you go, back to a pumpkin you turn. Well, uh, reports are that, uh, you know, Landman might even be getting a green dot chance uh, this year. So I think, you know, this new coaching staff and, and, and uh, regime maybe, you know, pays attention to some of these uh, analytics numbers and, and PFF type metrics because Mr. Nate Landman was second most in run stop percentage, meaning what his tackle led to a, a run stop. Uh, he was he was second in the league and 10th or 12th, 10th in run defense grade overall. So, you know, maybe these coaches took a look at that and said, that's who we want manning the middle. And, you know, if you look at those numbers, I would tend to agree. So I was a little nervous just based on because they have three good linebackers there now. Landman, Anderson, a second round pick, but not by this regime. And then Kate Nellis, the, the free agent signing from from uh, last year was his first in Atlanta. So I think Ellis is definitely going to remain as an entrenched, you know, starter. Um, but what they do now between the three of them is there going to be some crazy rotation, but it sounds like they want Lambin to be on, on the field, you know, nearing a hundred percent of the snaps as the green dot. So uh, he is going off as the LB. 71 right now because i think a lot of people kind of assumed what i did but this news i'm quickly rising him up uh, probably into the mid to early 30s um with the you know chance he could easily finish uh close to you know the the teens there um if he remains healthy and does earn that green dot potential so you do not have to reach for him even right now you could probably get him with your last picks in most of your drafts and he's going to be potentially a solid LB2 with LB1 fantasy potential. Love that. I think we could really see a lot very similar to Raheem Morris's defense a few years ago with Ernest Jones and Bobby Wagner. Ooh. Caden Ellis is a great rusher. I think he had nine right. sacks in his last year in New Orleans. Yeah. So you could see him just he, – him be back in that role, the pass rusher, and then nice. land it as the catch, catch linebacker and just rack up loads of tackles writing down all these names i like this <laughs> he also had fun fact he also has a sister named ocean trail who's a swimmer in oregon state landman does yeah oh, and ocean trail what a land name man yeah that's a weird name for somebody with land in their last name to be a swimmer right? he thinks she'd be a runner <laughs> right it sounds like good related. good genes at least <laughs> <laughs> all right joe who do you have for me <sighs> well, fellas, I'm ready to get hurt again. I am ready to get hurt again. This was one of my preseason crushes last year. Loved him as a prospect. Thought he was going to be awesome. And then Christian Harris didn't do Jack for the first six, ten weeks of the season. Got benched multiple times. Wasn't even trusted to play special teams. Like, wow, this guy might get cut. And then round week 11, something clicked and he turned into maybe a top 20 NFL linebacker mm. over just second half of the year. Um, took a little time, but over in that D'Amico Ryan's defense, he really did look like that Dre Greenlaw, Aziz Alshair from the San Francisco days. Um, they had, he had a lot of tackles, 75 tackles in the last nine games, including the playoffs. Did end up breaking 100 tackles overall in the season, despite 
really being what a 40% snap share in the first 10 weeks. So he had multiple pass breakups, tackles for loss, two sacks over that last nine weeks stretch as well. And now most importantly, Aziz Al Shair is in tow. So that he does not need to be the linebacker one. He doesn't have a lot of pressure. He's just he doesn't need to be the guy. He can just yeah. take over a lot of cleanup work and be use that athleticism to really make some big plays. At linebacker 46, I think he has a good chance to be linebacker too. I don't know if he'll ever turn into a Dre Greenlaw, but he did project very similarly as a prospect with athletic nice. scores, et cetera. But if he can be 80% of pre-injury, hope he gets better, Dre Greenlaw, that's a linebacker too for your teams. And you're getting him. Is he in the top 150? One, uh, Christian Harris is 84. 84, so end of the seventh round if it's an IDP only draft. Absolutely. All right. Well, yeah, I guess since was, we're doing three. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, you. yeah, you were right. So in our IDP invitational scoring, uh, week 11 through 18, he was uh, the LB 14 in points per game. So, yeah, that's a nice little – finish to the season there and um i agree like we saw you know two to two oh kind of come through and they gave him a chance and that didn't really work out um perryman was getting injured every freaking week so um yeah if, if al shahir can stay healthy and he could just play number two to there to him um i i love it i love christian harris at that but harris so. actually had the eighth best uh pass rush um oh, nice. the prp rate for from pff Amongst Beautiful. linebackers as well. So sack upside. <laughs> love that. Jesus love love to see the athleticism transition. Sometimes it's hard to find a place for those Alabama five stars, right? <laughs> Once they get to the league. But oh, yeah. Jamison dropped by. Hey, Jamison. How you doing, buddy? Hope you're enjoying uh, the great Northwest. <laughs> All right. The ocean the big shoes. <laughs> All right, so now we go to the third. We're on bonus rounds. Yeah, I'll, I'll be quick with mine. Um, no, so this guy's this guy's not even ranked right now. Um, you know, another homer pick for me. But Zach Bond of the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people are expecting the Kobe Dean. Now, this is purely speculation on camp reporting. So take it with a grain of salt. I'm, you know, I, it kind of makes sense. Uh, it sounds like. You know, Vic Fangio may have has just taken a liking to Bond, which, you know, that's the thing that, that we don't pay enough attention to, I think, at times is, you know, coaching decisions. And, you know, we, we tend to take the guys that we think should be playing, but if we're directly getting opposing information, factual information, you got to you gotta change and pivot. So this probably previously would have been the Kobe Dean, but – we're, we're getting camp reports that Zach Bond is running strongly with the first team and Devin White. Um, so this is pure opportunity speculation, um, pure speculation that he wins and holds down the LB2 job there. Um, and then hopefully he can stay on the field, uh, you know, be healthy all year long. So, um, again, completely free. This would be much deeper leagues to take a, a chance on Bond by – um, he's one of those guys that just feels like he feels like an eight landman or Jack Sanborn, except he it's not taking an injury for him to get on the field. He's completely unknown to, for the most part. Um, never really played much at all in his time with the Saints. He was a special teamer, emergency backup guy. Um, you know, I think last year they were sh maybe showcasing a little bit, but he he went off to to sign with the Eagles and free agency. So. Um, yeah, I just I just think this could be one of those guys, uh, these Cinderella stories for this year. Um, just more of a, a gut feel than anything else on this one because he doesn't have a lot of – there's no numbers really to dive into because he just hasn't played all that much yet in his career. <laughs> so, you know, I'm not going to spout off any rankings or anything because they're kind of irrelevant uh, just based on his playing time um, so far. But uh, the same – was to be said about Lambin last year. He, we had nothing to go off of, really. So um, just hope that he can, you know, clearly win the job, if anything. And uh, those the Kobe Dean dynasty shares might might be in the toilet right now, unfortunately. <laughs> Even more in the toilet than they are right More, yeah. <laughs> All right. Joe, who's your bonus linebacker? 
So I'm going to go back to Baltimore, hit second-year player Trenton Simpson, the guy taking over Patrick Queen's role. And a lot of this is just life next to Roquan Smith is a beautiful thing. <laughs> it's so easy. We saw Patrick Queen go from barely rosterable from an NFL sense to getting a pretty solid contract with with the Steelers and ESPN's staff raking him as a top 10 linebacker somehow, but I don't think anyone believes he is, but that's besides the point. Trenton Simpson, we've only seen one start from him last year in week 18 when Baltimore stat, sat their starters and Pittsburgh Pittsburgh was playing for a playoff spot. He did pretty darn well, though. Seven tackles, two for loss, and a sack. It's a good, good potential, if nothing else. He was a really strong pass rusher at Clemson with seven sacks in this penultimate season there. Um, couple, I think 12 total in his career. Good tackle totals in the mid-50s, which for college isn't bad, Call, especially power five. Tackle totals are super weird. But G5 teams, you'll see 180s and power five, 70s, a good number. It's weird. But in decent coverage, I don't think he's going to be a world beater, but a guy at linebacker 53 taking – Patrick Queen was the linebacker 20 in the master scoring last season. If we can get similar to that, I don't think there's a huge talent gap between Queen and Simpson, but if you can get a linebacker 30, maybe at drafting at linebacker 53, pretty decent value. And I'll take that. All right. Trenton Simpson from Baltimore. Gentlemen, that's three linebackers each. Now I know most leagues don't require that we start corners. And if we're being honest, it will always be the most frustrating position in all of fantasy football because it's the only position where the absolute best players are crap in IDP. We don't want the best corners. Everywhere else it makes sense except for corner. So if you are in a corner required league, do not, and I repeat, do not draft corners until the last round or two. Don't do it. And in fact, a little secret, I generally wait until waivers to pick one up right before week one because it doesn't really matter what corners you start. But if you're feeling a little bit froggish, you want to hop, Steve and Joe are have one late round guy you can snag so that you don't leave your draft empty handed. Santa, who do you got for us? Yeah, so this is definitely a deep cut, but... Uh... Second year player for the Indianapolis Colts, Juju Brents, um, former second round pick, I believe. Uh, big body corner uh, set up so that you know if he if he doesn't allow catches, I believe he's going to be very efficient with tackling. Um, just just being a naturally bigger human being playing corner, which we're not seeing as much these days. Um, so what is he? Is he Six three, yeah, six three, one ninety eight. So Big I just love that. I love that build. Uh, he was another guy kind of snake bearing with injuries last year. Uh, only started about half the games. Uh, still came away with uh, forty three combined tackles, thirty of them solo. Uh, fumble recovery, six passes defended, uh, no picked or one pick. Um, so I just think the playing time is going to go way up there. Um, even though the games he played in, like um, what were his snap counts? That he had crazy uh, snap counts either. He uh, oh, 82 percent. That's not bad, but I think we'll we'll see that even tick up a little bit more. Um, yeah, I just just betting on a young guy who I think will probably get tested and picked on a little bit. Um, you know, Kenny Moore still manning the slot there for the most part. So um, yeah, I just I just just a guy I like. I, I his height caught my eye. It's being a second round pick, you know, lots of the other corners from that class are kind of the, the standouts and the bigger names. And he's just kind of one of these guys I like as being an under the radar name um, again in, in super deep leagues. If you want to take uh, for free or off the waivers <laughs> again, only if you're in a yeah. cornerback required league, yes, <laughs> if you're just in a DB league, ignore everything no, no we're bother. talking about right now. <laughs> All right, Joe, who do you have for me? We'll say with that rule, I think there are a couple exceptions to the no corners rule. Those are guys who are going to be in the slot, snap in, snap yes. out. Juju Brent's teammate, Kenny Moore, yes, my favorite Colt, and has been for a while as an example. Um, there's various ones around. Nate Hobbs for the Raiders. 
And then this guy, I think, is going to join that group, that grouping now. The Titans, Roger McCreary. He was honest, really spectacular for the Titans last year. Looking at his total numbers, he had 86 tackles, six pass breakups, two sacks. He had 12 games with 12 plus points. That's IDP Masters tournament scoring. And a lot of the games he didn't have 12 plus points were games that he had to go onto the outside, which were week one, then a couple weeks in the middle of the year when Sean Murphy bunting, Caleb Farley, and whoever their other boundary corner, whose name I am spacing, got hurt, which was quite often. Yeah. McCreary was an absolute stud when he was in the box. I know in, earlier in the offseason when we were doing our DB show, I talked a lot about Drew Phillips. He's one of my favorite players now with the Giants. Um, and the guy who was my comp for him was McCreary, the guy who's just not the biggest corner but is an absolute maniac and will just go in and try to knock your head off even though he's 5'10 and maybe 180, 190. So I think that's still going to be the style he is. Now they have two legitimate boundary corners in Blacheria Sneed and Shadobe Wuzie. And if those guys stay healthy, there is no way McCreary is leaving the slot. This is a guy I'm willing to take as my DB 2.5 in a 2DB in a DB league. Maybe one want him as my second DB, but if it's taking an extra one, I'd be very content. Or if I totally just punt the position, upside shot. I think he's really going to be very, very good. If he can get 12 points a game in 17 or 16 or 17 games, that is going to be a steal for you at DB 43. All right, Roger McCreary, it is another unranked gentleman. Uh, well, it's time to close out with the most mercurial of positions, the place where very few top players can repeat every year, safeties. So if you're playing in a DB league, you're going to probably want to start mainly safeties. Except, of course, for slot corners who rush. Uh, so I asked these gentlemen to come up with two. And I think one cheated and came up with three, but we'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> it wasn't even me this time. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, Jameson came easy. on to cheat? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, Jameson. All right, Steve, you're up first. Who do you first, have for me at safety? All right, first guy will be the non-cheating one. Uh, Jordan Battle for the Cincinnati Bengals. Uh DB 69, very nice ranking right there. And I think he'll he'll finish a lot sooner than that. So I think people are worried about the, the breakdown of that whole defensive back group, right? Um, we had Von Bell come back and, and re-sign. Uh, Geno Stone came over from the Baltimore Ravens as a signing. Um, Dax Hill is still there. And then you've got Jordan Battle. Well, Dax Hill is apparently attempting to transition to a boundary corner. So that knocks away one guy from the mix. Um, I believe that Battle will be the primary strong safety um, playing, you know, an overwhelming majority of snaps this year. Uh, they took him in the second round last year, uh, you know. And then I think there's going to be a rotation at free safety uh, between Bob Bell and Geno Stone. Uh, Geno Stone was absolutely – that was his main – position coming over from Baltimore. He filled in for Marcus Williams for a couple of years there uh, during injuries, playing more free safety. And Von Bell at this stage of his career, I think makes more sense to play more of that traditional free safety type role. So I think it's wheels up for battle as the one and only uh, strong safety for the Cincinnati Bengals. And we've seen that position just crush um, return on investment almost every year, uh, depending who's who's there. I mean, Dexel did it last year. Um, he is just transitioning now. I think uh, being a smaller body, I think they're, yeah, you know, working him to to become more of a, a boundary corner there. So, yeah, I'm not really worried. I'm buying the the uh, potential cloudiness there, the potential scaredness of others, um, uh, you know, unsure of the situation. And I, I he's just one of my favorite targets this year later uh, in, if I'm punting safety, which I normally am. <laughs> All right. I love that strategy. Thank you. So we have Jordan Battle. Joe, who do you have for me? I am going to be a little bit of a homer here and go with an Indianapolis Colts. Uh, DB24 right now. Someone who finished a bit higher than that. He was DB or safety 16 points per game last season. And again, Masters tournament scoring. Julian Blackman. Okay. He was really good for the Colts last year. He had 
only three safeties were in the box more than him. That's Rayshon Jenkins, Jordan Poyer, and Kyle Duggar, who are three of the top box safeties in the league. And honestly, two of them might not even really be in that stratosphere anymore in Jenkins and Poyer. So great time. He had just missed 100 tackles after he got injured and so missed the last two, mostly three games. It was been great against the run and also unlike most strong safeties he actually does have a very good range he was a free safety at utah and was spectacular in that role he started there with the colts when he was drafted until he tore his achilles or acl he's done both in his career unfortunately but so he had four interceptions and eight pass breakups in 15 games last year a lot of ball production and again almost 100 tackles i think Really good strat- strategy there to take him later and uh, end of your DB two range. There is no, there's no competition for that box role there. Nick Cross is a rangy safety, and the other safety on roster is Ronnie Thomas, who is also more for free safety. And also, neither of them are nearly as good as Blackman is. He's on another one year deal to kind of prove it. And hopefully, get a big deal next year. So I think they're really going to use him a lot near the box and near the line of scrimmage. Awesome. So Julian Blackman is your Love first safety. Uh, well, Santa, why don't you top it? Who do you have? <laughs> All right. So here's my cheat code. Now there's context here as to why I have two names. Okay. So we're going New York Giants. Uh, some combination of the rookie Tyler Newman or the vet, uh, who I believe is only a second or third year player in Dane Belton. So they're sort of um, well, here, here's what the information I learned. I think it was today. It was either today or yesterday. Um, so Newbin's a little banged up, and I think people are defaulting, giving him the job. Um, J- Jason Pinnock is there, um, who I think is more of the, the free safety role. So whoever wins this strong safety pretty much only has uh, Bo- Big Bobby O in front of them to compete with tackles, maybe some Micah McFadden here and there. So I think there's a lot of tackle, excuse me, tackle opportunity that is going to find its way to that second level of the defense for one of these guys to soak up. So the quote I heard from um, the defensive coordinator, I believe, was that it is Dane Belton's job to lose uh, to Tyler Newbin. And Newbin is fighting off some injuries right now, which for a rookie is you know, not great crucial camp snaps and, you know, being on, you know, as the saints coach said, you can't uh, win the job in the training room. Right. So, you know, if Tyler Newman does somehow, you know, come from behind photo finish and, and take it away from Belton at, at the end of camp here, um, he would be my, my investment, but shoot Dane Belton going off as the DB 153, I believe was the ranking. I mean, that's just a free square right there. Um, they've, they've, they've given him the job, essentially, and, and, and Newbin has to win it from him. Um, so, yeah, that is another one that I think uh, people are either incorrectly handing the job to Newbin or thinking about this sort of cloudiness of the situation about who's going to be playing with Pinnock there um, in, in, the, in the back of the secondary. So uh, right now I would be taking Belton especially – with the injury to uh to Newbin there. So did you say D B 153? I believe that's right. Or maybe is that a player overall? Let me see. Belton. It's not overall. Yeah, when I'm on the D B section specifically, I don't know why they rank so many DBs, but yeah, <laughs> DB wants 153. I mean, so that's essentially unranked, right? Let's I mean, I'm being unranked. hyperbolic here, obviously, <laughs> but unless you're in a start eight. <laughs> DB league. Yeah. That's an incredibly low ranking yeah. for somebody who's going to be a starter. <laughs> and you, need yeah. to, you need to be in the start 12, 12 <laughs> or 13. Listen, that is been. not my subject, but um, that's what I'm here for 12 times. 12, yeah. Well, yes, that'd be one forty four, and he yeah. still wouldn't be drafted. No, because you would probably take some corners in there. Oh no, corners count for deep in the DB ranking. Yeah, that is That's that crazy. is shocking. So oh, I gotta no. say, I really love that Dane Belton selection. Tyler Newman, I think, is a good prospect. I always thought yeah. he projects as a free safety, as that, okay. that quarter shell, kind of over the top safety. I think he can be for a free safety. I think he can be really good for fantasy amongst those guys. But right. I, he's not a box safety. He's 
too good in coverage to be a box safety, I think. So Belton, I think, makes a lot of sense. Love that. So we're just flipping their rankings. Newman is the DB32. So that's a top, you know, DB3. Um, so that's where you can plug Belton potentially in at. So, yeah, I think they should ultimately be swapped, at least for redraft purposes. In Dynasty, mm-hmm. yeah, I guess maybe – that, that could be an appropriate spread because we're expecting Newbin as a second rounder to take the reins eventually uh, going forward there. But uh, man, if we're talking about just this year, that's a, that's a great value. <laughs> I know I say it all the time. I'm mm-hmm. a little bit of a broken record to me. There is no such thing as dynasty IDP. I play every dynasty IDP league. Like it's a redraft league. Yeah. Because for- you don't, people just disappear. Yeah. Like if you're waiting huh. on Nicobe Dean to learn how to play linebacker, true, you're going to be waiting and hope you're in an eight year rebuild. <laughs> All right, Max. wait, Steve, uh, Joe, you're the last guy. Who do we have for yes. us? So I think what's a big issue of mine, JJ, is I play a lot of it like Dynasty. I sit on <laughs> a lot of guys that I love, including a guy like a Jaden Hicks, who is currently the backup to the last player I have in Justin Reed for the Kansas City Chiefs, who does in his own right is one of my five favorite players in football. Don't know why I've always loved him. Hold on. Time out. Yeah. I'm interrupting. So who is your top five list of favorite players? If Justin Reed, a safety is in the top five. There's a bunch of weird ones in there. I want to know your superstars, your Jamar chases. Oh gosh. I need to see a roster to see. Um, I love a Kenny Moore. Naheem Hines is in there. Colts fandom. Um, Wait, your top five current NFL players include Naheem Hines? This isn't good. This is just my favorite. Like, oh, enjoy. Okay. okay, just enjoy. Oh, boy. <laughs> I don't think <laughs> – just just to clarify, Naheem Hines is not a top five. He might not be a top no, five. No, no, no. I understand. I, I understand we're talking about just favorites. Yeah. Like Tariq yeah. Cohen just re- – did he retire today from the Jets? I think so. But I love Tariq Cohen. Yeah. If he was in the league, he was always one of my favorite guys mm-hmm. to watch. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt no, what you were about to say about Justin Reed. No, you're but good. that was I, a very surprising statement. It is. Part of it as well is that he's a really good kicker, and he's probably going oh. to be handling kickoffs this year is what it sounds like, which that's will, right. with this new setup, I think that's going to add not a huge amount, but it's going to add a little bit of value. If it's basically a run play, then you have another defender out there. I think you can chalk up another three to five tackles for Reed, which over a course of a season isn't nothing. Um, like with Julian Blackman, I said how he was the fourth highest usage in the box among safeties last year. Justin Reed was right behind him. But Ooh. unlike Blackman never didn't play in the slot a whole lot. Justin Reed also was fourth in mean, slot usage among safeties with the only ones above him were Jalen Thompson and then Josh Metellus and Kyle Hamilton, the best slot player in the league. So Hamilton's another top five for me, by the way. Dude's a freak. But I think he also – I also might put him top five good players in football. But another conversation. Yes. yes. Another conversation. We're going to make so, a whole pod out of Joe's top five list. We might have to. <laughs> Last week we were talking about weird takes that we have – your takes and favorites might this might have to be something for later okay I like anyway this. points per game justin reed was eight safety 18 last year he's going db 29 right now so unless there's 12 corners going there it's a value he just missed 100 tackles as well that had he not sat week 18 like most of the chief starters did probably would have hit 100 tackles also three sacks he's a really good pass rusher a lot of corner blitzes he will do. And I think there's a chance he's doing a lot more slot work this year with Trent. Mc- there's a chance Trent McDuffie plays on the outside more with um, Jarius need gone, yeah. which sucks. McDuffie yeah. would definitely have been a contention for the cornerback slot, but I just worry it's going to be very luxurious needy. But yeah. again, Reed, I think is awesome. I think he's a near lock for a hundred tackles and very good DB two play. Love and that. I just love him. So, Love that. Huh. Listen, I learn something new every day when I pod with Joe. Uh, That's why I do this, man. This is fantastic. Well, it is time for tags. Uh, You guys did great work today. 
Uh, so we're going to let everybody know where they can find us. Any final thoughts you might have? Santa, you are the guest. You may go first. All right. Appreciate it. Yeah. So the new website, idpplus.com. We're now we're now into the .com space. Uh, no longer .org. So that's Ooh. very exciting. Um, yeah. Just I, I, I'm really I just totally crazy about um, where we're all the fun things we're going to be doing this year with the new launch and all that good stuff. So you'll find my work and all the people's work that I uh, help edit and, and, and kind of corral the, the sheep there uh, <laughs> and herd the cats and all that good stuff uh, over at that website. Uh, yeah. Good old, I have 10 of my own uh, real cats. So, uh, you know, I don't Jealous. know which one. What? <laughs> I am learning way too much information. Yeah, you know, we, JD Vance would think that you're not a good person because you, yeah, <laughs> sorry, not to get political, it, it's all good. Yeah, I, I couldn't care less what he would think about me. Sorry, um, 10 cats, go on, <laughs> but yeah, on the Twitter streets, Dicey Santa. I'm trying to contribute, um, on not only Twitter, but there's some really awesome groups so on Reddit, there's an IDP group on Facebook. We, of course, have our own page, but there is an awesome, um, IDP. I believe it's just IDP football or IDP fantasy uh, Facebook group that is enormous. Uh, the posts get great feedback, and there's a chat uh, that does great. So shout out to uh, the admin there, William. Um, awesome dude, and I love being a part of that group as well. Some really good information uh, flowing through that group chat as well. So, um, But also where you can get access to myself and all the great brains um, over at the whole crew. You sign up for that subscription there, get the Discord access. It's probably my favorite thing that we offer um, outside of awesome rankings and all the really exciting tools that are literally right around the corner here uh, in a few few days, few weeks. Uh, but just having access and getting the personalized team and roster management um, from all of us is just one of my favorite things to do. So I tell people like, I love talking through other people's teams and like league setups and scoring setups and roster setups, do getting quirky and fun with it. I think these days then I do actually like doing my own teams and drafting my own squads and all that. So I'm, I'm weird right now. <laughs> Listen, it's a great place to be in. It's a great place to be in. Uh, Joe, you're up. You can find me at idpplus.com now, where I'm one of the cats that Steve is wrangling in. You can find me writing there, though I only have two of my own, but going to give my wife ideas to get 10, to get up to 10. She would love to. Frankly, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be opposed to either. Love cats. Anywho, um, you can find me on X at Jolo63, tweeting about IDP, Dynasty, Orioles, go birds, especially now that Jameson isn't here to say anything otherwise. And that's about it. Santa, thank you for coming on. And JJ, you're the best. I uh, love you, Joe. Um, so I'm at JJ Wetter on Twitter. I'm not going to lie. I'm a little, I'm a little uh, shook right now by all the cat talk. I'm not judging anybody. I'm not judging cats or pets too. I'm a dog person, but hey, I might have I to do an intervention. I got two of those. I, yeah. Just quickly, Joe, if you want to boost it up, all you have to do is take in a pregnant stray mom to your house that your wife gets contacted by someone because they know she helps with that. And then when you just keep her and her litter, the plan was to give the litter away. We only ended up giving one of six away. And now you have six new cats. Um, boom, you're you're at eight right there. So that's that all you got to do. That really happened to my aunt. Oh. To, I guess her aunt a week ago was just given a cat that turned out to be pregnant. Yeah, it's uh, it's so hard. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, tune in next week for Cat Talk uh, on the Rider Dynasty. Uh, thank you to Steve for joining us tonight. Thank you for all the hard work you and the whole crew does behind the scenes to make IDP Plus work. Thank you to Joe for all of his work, uh, putting up the banners, looking up all these players, talking about cats, making up top five lists out of nowhere. Uh, make sure you tune in next Thursday to the All Out Blitz uh, when Doug and I welcome Jesse Morse to the show. Then come back on Friday for the Rod Pod, where Joe will be hosting a solo pod while Jameson and I are at the Expo. So from all of us to all of you, be safe, be well, and as always, 
Boat drinks, my friends. Boat drinks. Thank you for watching the IDP Plus YouTube network. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Be sure to tap the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload new content.